This had been the world's first jet aircraft, bringing unparalleled glory to Italy. And by an unconventional imagination, Jay almost sent the development of the jet engine down the wrong path. With the Campini Caporni N1, the Italians proved to the world that even in aircraft design they could seriously bring joy to the world. In the last issue we talked about Italian engineer Luigi Stipa's flying barrel, an attempt to increase the speed of a piston-propeller aircraft by adding a culvert to it. While this did have a touch of the later jet engine in it, the aerodynamic disadvantages of such a rudimentary culvert propulsion system were far greater than envisaged, and countries still have to figure out how to make the dream a reality. In 1931, while Stipa was working day and night on the barrel in the workshops of Caporni Aerotech, one of his Italian colleagues, Secondo Campini, patented his own design for a thermosetting engine and immediately submitted a report to the Italian Air Force. But without the backing of a major company, the government was not interested in the civilian scientist's pheasant design. In 1934, after repeated tests, Stipa's flying barrel was abandoned and its owner, Caporni Aerotech, was not happy that the investment had been wasted, the problem with the flying barrel was that the culverts were too large and presented a number of unexpected aerodynamic problems. And by reducing the culvert diameter further and increasing the engine thrust, the true benefits of culvert power would certainly be demonstrated. But how to solve the apparent contradiction between reducing the culvert diameter and increasing the engine thrust? Campini confidently took his proposal to the podium at Caporni. His hot jet engine is a mix of Italian flavors. The small diameter of the propeller was really limited in the amount of thrust it could provide, so a combustion chamber at the back was added to inject fuel and ignite heat. However, once the combustion chamber was installed, it became clear that the air needed to be pressurized and to mix with the fuel, so a compressor was installed at the front. But with a compressor there would be no need for a propeller. So we could just let the piston engine take the compressor directly with it and that would solve the problem. Perfect. The Italians did manage to build an aero engine that seemed to fit the principle of a jet engine. Except that the jets that the British and Germans were working on at the time used turbine-driven compressors, whereas the Campini's engine used a piston engine to drive the compressor, the poor imperialist had a poor way of living. Looking at the sad faces of Britain and Germany, who were also developing jets next door, Italy thought it had found a gold mine, and with renewed confidence, Camporni resubmitted a design for a new jet engine to the air ministry. The Mussolini government was keen to improve its international standing, and being the first to send a jet into the sky must have been a particularly prestigious event, and with the backing of a major company, the proposal was naturally highly regarded and quickly approved, however. The requirement was that two prototypes had to be built and flown in the sky within two years. Seeing that his ambition had a chance of becoming a reality, Campini immediately worked overtime to meet the schedule. But it was too difficult to build such a completely unprecedented innovation in two years. By 1936, the two prototypes were still not finished, but fortunately the two engines were almost ready. As we thought earlier, the frontmost three-stage pressurized engine, powered by a Fascini 12-cylinder V engine, ran at 18,000 revolutions per minute, and the combustion chamber at the back, after pressurizing the airflow, was ejected by the tailpipe to produce an effective thrust of around 750 kg. After seeing the engine, Mussolini was willing to wait until 1939, when the Caporni Campini N1, tailor-made for the engine, finally rolled off the assembly line. Compared to the cute Taliedo Stipa, the N1 looked much more normal, with its air inlets in the nose, all-metal semi-monocoque construction, cantilevered lower monoplane and hydraulically retractable rear three-point landing gear, it looked like a cigar with wings and cockpit, quite handsome and full of modern times. But the handsome N1 failed its test flight in August 1940, achieving a speed of 359 km per hour and an altitude of 4. 000m, a bare pass. The core of the problem was the Italian-style hybrid, piston, jet engine, a heavy piston engine at the heart of the power plant, which not only failed to exploit the advantages of jet propulsion, but was even less efficient than a propeller. The worst thing is that the pilot is sitting right on the combustion chamber, which has very little jet power and is so hot that both pilots have to keep the hatch open the whole time, making it a completely unsuitable place for people to be. But there is at least one consolation. The N1's maiden flight did cause a sensation in the world, with 33 countries, including Britain, sending congratulatory messages to Italy and the International Aeronautical Association recognizing it as the world's first jet flight. Now we all know that this honor should have gone to the German Heat 178, which flew in August 1939, only it was kept secret at the time. The applause from everywhere satisfied Mussolini's vanity and Caporni was instructed to continue improving the N1. But Caporni was well aware of the true capabilities of the N1. But the leader had already given the order, so he had no choice but to continue to improve the odd aircraft, resulting in a CA-183 BIS design with a piston engine and a large propeller for the main powertrain. 
with Jet Power relegated to a subordinate role, just to prove to the leader that it was still the N1 son. With the start of World War II, the Caponi Campini N1 was a flash in the pan, eventually remaining in a museum in its old age. Proving that relying on a piston powertrain to turn into a jet engine was a dead end and that the new gas turbine engine was the star of the future. Still, as a first attempt at fan-operated culvert power, from the Stipa to the N1, the Italians managed to put half a foot in the door of the jet age by their unconventional imagination, an unexpected achievement for a poor imperialist with a weak aeronautical base. Thank you for watching the end, if you liked it, remember to leave a like before you go, follow me, bring you interesting technology stories, we'll see you next time.